what hope is there to do convex optimization for nonlinear systems, right? So I'll, I'll stay discreet here in time only. But. So it's not a linear constraint anymore. So it's not going to just snap into the, L, the, the QP formulation. So you should have a bunch of things buzzing around in your head, right? So we've talked a lot about sums of squares and polynomial optimization. Right, so you could actually write down the trajectory optimization problem as a polynomial optimization problem. You could use sauce or other sums of squares or other polynomial optimization tools. But we don't do that. Um, we've tried a few times a little bit. But uh, it's the solvers, these are big problems typically. Like the QP we wrote on the last time is a, was a big QP, especially in the horizon, right? And uh, the solvers for sums of squares problems just aren't good enough yet. They will be. But right now, we typically don't. Um, It's the size of the problem, but also the conditioning of the problem. That hasn't been something that we've, we've done a lot of yet. Um, really, I'd say just because the solvers aren't good enough yet. And probably we haven't found the right formulations yet, but I'm going to blame the solvers. I didn't have to think much about it for the QP, so I shouldn't have to think that much about it for the, uh, for the polynomial version. So iterative LQR, differential dynamic programming, which I've already mentioned now, those are ways to use the linear um, approximations to solve <coughs> nonlinear optimization problems. But once you have an iteration like that, you're not guaranteed for it to find, it's, it's still, again, a local method. Right? Every individual step is guaranteed to succeed, but you're not guaranteed that the iteration will find a solution to the nonlinear problem. There are some problems that you can use convex optimization for. They're a little bit different in spirit, but there's a really important class of systems, um, which are the differentially flat systems, where you can use some of these ideas for nonlinear systems. How many people have heard of differential flatness? Curiosity. In what context have you heard of it? <coughs> Quadrotor, right? Cool. So um, I wonder how many people would have heard of it if it wasn't for quadrotors. Um, OK, so the definition is sort of uh, easy. Understanding the implications is a little bit harder. But, but let me just write down the definition, right? So a system is differentially flat if, if there exists some flat outputs So I'll write y, my output y is some function of, it's got to be a function of x, my state, u, but also it can be potentially a function of the derivatives of u. Up to some pth derivative, if you will. 
sort of an obtuse thing, but let's run with it, okay? And the key property is that I need to be able to, from just having a, having a trajectory in Y, I need to be able to back out the trajectories in my state and in my control inputs. Okay, so that again, oh, and, and for this to make sense, you want the dimension of y equal the dimension of u. Because you'd like, for every trajectory y, you'd like to be able to, to extract u. <clears throat> this is sometimes called um, it's related to the Lie um, brackets Lee Blackland. it's the Lee Black Blackland equivalence to a trivial system basically All right, so what the heck does that mean? Okay, so <clears throat> I can have a nonlinear, underactuated system, okay? But if I can find some outputs of that system, such that if I prescribe the outputs of the system, it, 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 there's only one way the system could have achieved those outputs. Then I can potentially plan just the outputs of the system and back out what the state and control had to have been. So for the quadrotor example, the famous example now is the quadrotor. It turns out the flat outputs are the x, y, z position of the quadrotor and the yaw angle of the quadrotor. If you tell me the x, y, z trajectory of the quadrotor and its yaw, then there's only one set of states that the quadrotor could have possibly go, gone to satisfying the dynamics that would have achieved that x, y, z, and yaw. Right? I could tell you exactly what the state must have been to achieve that. And similarly, I could tell you exactly what the actions. There's four inputs on a quadrotor, four thrusters. I could tell you exactly what those thrusters must have been if the system went through this one particular trajectory in x, y, and yaw, x, y, z, and yaw. Okay, just because the, it's limited in what it can do. So having the four output variables is enough to exactly tell me what the, the state and control had to have been. Even though the state is a higher dimensional space, right? And these mappings, x and u here, from, from, the, from y and its, its, the output y and its derivatives, those can be big, complicated, nonlinear mappings, and they are for the quadrotor example, okay? But through those mappings, if I plan a trajectory in Y, then I can back out what the trajectory had to have been in the other ones. And the trajectories in Y are, can be potentially relatively unconstrained. I, well, maybe a different way to say that is it's hard to reason about constraints in this framework, but if I pretend for a moment the system is unconstrained, then I can write down arbitrary trajectories in Y and always find the state and action that it would have had to have executed to do that. Okay? So there's actually, the quadrotor is the, the one that people know now, but there's lots of good examples of differential flatness, um, sometimes result, sort of surprising. So one of the classic ones is an n-link planar snake. So if you, if, if you have a snake in the plane, not on the plane, in the plane, <laughs> the, and you got it's got n links, then it turns out if you just know that was I didn't even, I didn't plan that I promise I, was, I wouldn't do it again I promise but uh, 
um, if I know what the nose of the of the plane uh, of the uh, snake was doing, then I know exactly what everything would have done. Okay, that somehow this system is highly constrained, and and knowing just what one of the tips of the snake did, given the dynamics, tells me what everything had to have done. Okay, that's a classic example. There's another one. You know, one I, one of the ones I like is sort of the there's a convey crane problem. You can even have like a suspended cable. Like I think, uh, if we imagine you have an airplane, um, you know, flying along with a with a a load coming off the bottom here, right? And there's I don't know, lots and lots of degrees of freedom here. And this is a load. Is it? And there's actually great videos online if you look for like helicopter pilots that are putting enormous payloads in the back of a truck just by like swinging, you know, just their, the, their mastery of, uh, of the cable dynamics is just ridiculous and I wouldn't want to be in the field when that was happening, but um, pilots can do amazing things. But it turns out, I, don't, I won't claim that they're using differential flatness, but it turns out if you, if you know the trajectory of the load, which is a low dimensional thing, then you can back out uniquely what the trajectory of the plane and the inputs to the plane would have had to have been to make the cable dynamics satisfy the constraints and actually just planning in the trajectory of the, in the trajectory of the load of the carrying thing you can you can use differential flatness to figure out what the plane would have had to have done it's pretty cool right so that takes a arbitrarily high degree of freedom system and brings it down to a low dimensional planning problem in our world i mean even the um, you know there's other examples rolling pennies and and uh, and other things um, in our world, the not surprising one could walking be. Well, the, the planning footsteps is a um, um, is a lot of constraints that you'd have to throw on. Um, but I do think center mass dynamics or something like that. There could be hope for finding flatness there. The center of mass dynamics unperturbed is already linear, so you don't have the same motivation for finding flatness. But yes, I, uh, yeah, I think I would I wouldn't be surprised if there were humanoid relevant flatness, flat outputs. But I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that yet. Um, so you know the pendulum, for instance. This is just this is sort of obvious, I guess, but. Um, I think it's a good way to see what the flatness is doing and why it's cool, but also a little limited, right? So in my pendulum dynamics, if I were to choose my output to just be theta, and then I can certainly write down my state as a function of, of y and its derivatives, right? And I can certainly write down u as a function of y and its derivatives. Right? That's all easy and obvious and good. Right? So what this is saying, but I but I haven't been able to write down my constraints, right? So what this is saying is I could, if I plan a trajectory in theta then I know what my torque would have had to have been for the pendulum, right? So if I were to plan a trajectory that went to the top, I can back out exactly what the torques and the state would have had to have been for that to happen, okay? By looking at the derivative, time derivative, to get the velocities, you know, that's sort of an obvious thing, but it's not very relevant because I don't have any limits. It's just like my feedback uh, linearization example that I did in the first lecture, right? It would be very relevant if there was some way for me to encode constraints on y and its derivatives, which somehow enforce the torque limit. But that's hard to do, maybe impossible. We don't know. We thought about it a little bit before the lecture and didn't come up with anything good. Michael thinks it's impossible. I'm on the fence. Yeah, so. Um, but that, so, so that gives you a sense. I mean, so it's sort of the extension. It's a net, it's a sort of an extension of the idea of feedback linearization, but it could, or maybe partial feedback linearization in the quadrotor case, right? It's saying that I can completely control 
it's a little bit different than, than, than that. Um, but it, I can completely control x, y, z, and, and yaw. And the, the opposite way to say it is if I plan an x, y, z, and yaw, I can back out what my controller would have had to have been. OK, and that turns out to be extremely useful. right? So um, since not everybody raised their hand, let me show the big result um, that is why people know about differential flatness. So this is from, uh, from Penn. This is their quadrotor acrobatics using um, differential flatness. There's a part of it that I think is, is the, the real hallmark of it. But first, they just got the thing flying aggressively, um, the variety of controllers. but. This is, this is the part that I think shows off the, um, the planning, right? So they can put in, keep in regions, a convex region, saying x at time uh, 4 is inside that hoop, x at time 10 is inside this hoop. They can also have that being a more complicated constraint, and they can fly through dynamic hoops. I think that is probably the crowning, I think that's the best example of sort of being able to plan that on the fly. It's really just the catching example done with more flair, right? But I think that's a super awesome result for what you could do with sort of QP planning that can run on the fly, map through differential flatness to a nonlinear system, bada boom, bada bing. I mean, like, what, so what kind of constraints do you have on like taking Ys and mapping them back to things that you can actually do? For the quadrotor, it seems like you Yeah, so it's very hard, and they, I don't believe they do have any way to put in input limits. So they're basically assuming the quad, in the planning, it's, it's assuming that, they're, that, 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 I mean, it could, that the propellers could produce thrust down, um, right? They, they put an objective, which is minimum snap, uh, right? So, it, so they try to keep the derivative small, and so hopefully smoother trajectories mean reasonable control effort, but it's hard to, um, to put bounds on the controller. Well, you could, you could potentially find a, uh, a flat outputs where you could put natural bounds on the flat outputs <coughs> and impose something. But for the pendulum, we didn't see it. And uh, yeah, so there's limitations there. And the other thing is that you this is only allowing them to think about x, y, z, and yaw. You'll see a lot of awesome results from the grass lab of like flying through windows and stuff like that, but they can't use flatness for that. If, as soon as the, the, the command is pitch or roll, they have to flip to a different controller. So they'll use differential flatness to plan up to the window and then do something else and then turn it on again. Right? So there's limitations. Yeah? What's that? I think they, they have a closed loop uh, attitude controller that they run during that and then they do um, some iterative learning control to get a nice smooth trajectory. I think they put the window in after, but, I, but you can ask them. Um, so assuming that you uh, you can be whatever you want it to be, does differential flatness imply that every trajectory has a corresponding control input? That is that's right. So um, there's some smoothness constraints on the mapping, but yes, that's okay. because it's the unconstrained problem. It's not like an upper bound saying that it's one. It's just like saying every trajectory has one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, so the, whether you have to execute with those derivatives is a different thing, right? Your goal is to, I mean, you can take as many derivatives as you want of a mathematical, you know, polynomial, in, and then as long as the controller that comes back out is a signal over time u, which is some, described by some polynomial, then you can execute it. So typically those higher derivatives don't end up in your feedback controller. I think, uh, yeah, I, I would think not. Yes? So are they using these mapping functions to get the inputs from the trajectory? Or do they have like another controller that tracks the trajectory that they go from? I think they, they have another controller sitting on top that tracks it. And there's, they, they, that particular work, they made a big deal about doing that correctly in SE3, you know, to, in, in the 
uh, on the quaternion, basically, for the for orientation. Yeah. So is the key thing that you go back uniquely from from your Y to the yes. unique controller? Or, but like, suppose I had a system where that mapping was like subjective. So I could always find control inputs that execute that Y. Maybe there's two ways to do it. Would that not be super useful also? It's, like it should. It seems like it should be super useful. Um, or is it? The you know the, the theorems sur surrounding differential flatness ask for it to be unique. Um, I haven't looked carefully enough to know if it, something would break in, in the in the middle there. But my intuition is the same as yours that if I could find a map, if I can always find a mapping from y back to u, then it should be should be useful. Yeah. Uh, is there any kind of standard procedure to test whether a system has differential flatness or not? Because it doesn't seem like it's a very constructive definition. I think it's not constructive at all. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, that's the weakness, right? So you have to find differential flatness. Same way you used to have to find the Apinoff functions or something like that. So maybe there's, you know, maybe there's hope, but so far you have to get, and I, and I, I, I don't think there's unique differential flat outputs, right? I would get, you could probably find multiple flat outputs that would have different properties, right? Okay, cool.